Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ross Virginia. I direct the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth College, and we're also part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And uh, this afternoon's talk is also co-sponsored by OSHER at Dartmouth. Um, it, it's, it's always a real pleasure when, a, when a, a friend, a colleague, and someone you admire comes back to Dartmouth to share work that was partially done here. Um, and perhaps even inspired a little bit by some of the people that, that you were able to interact with. Our, our guest today is Patty Woodworth. Um, Patty was a visiting fellow at the Dickey Center in 2008. And while he was here, he, he was working on a long-running book project. Um, we're going to hear about the book. We're going to hear about the project. And, and I think we should be inspired by his view of the options for our future. Um, Patty is currently a visiting fellow at the Department of Environmental Science and Studies at DePaul University, and he's teaching courses on environment that relate to the themes of his book, and he's also teaching environmental journalism, because Patty, foremost, is a very talented writer, a writer who thinks about culture, about environment, about people, and he writes in many different formats for different audiences. Um, he, he was on the staff of the Irish Times as an arts editor, then as a foreign desk editor. And I think a long-running theme of his, and a special area of interest, has been Basque Country. He's, he's an expert on, on the politics, the environment, the people, the food. I mean, in addition to writing about Basque Country and, and having two really widely acclaimed books on this, um, he's really into travel in that region and has been engaged as uh, a travel consultant and guide. And um, I'm ready to sign up. So if anyone wants to see Basque Country, Talk to Patty afterwards. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, he, he's, he's written for many, many different outlets, International Heritage Tribune, Vanity Fair, Scientist, Sunday Times, Ecological Restoration, BBC Wildlife, on and on. And he's also frequently engaged as, uh, for radio interviews. Um, he has a story to tell, and he's not shy about sharing his views and what he's learned about the environment and our future. Um, today he's going to talk about his, his most recent book, a book that was uh, worked on while he was here at Dartmouth as a visiting fellow in the Dickey Center in 2008. And um, he'll be, uh, the book will be available uh, to be signed afterwards out just in front of the auditorium here, Our Once and Future Planet. Um, in, in this book, Patty talks about our relationship with the environment and, and possibilities for restoring damaged lands and, and damaged landscapes. And um, I think what I really appreciate about this book is, you know, I teach in the environmental studies program. And mostly we talk about doom and gloom. And we're getting near the end of the term, and by now students are just kind of really drawn out. Like they're just really depressed about hearing another story about the environment. And, and I think what Patty offers is actually some hope and some optimism and some true examples, uh, inspiring examples of how people and communities can actually take action to change the future uh, direction of the planet. And that's what this book is really about. Um, in, in July, Science Magazine, this is the top international science peer-reviewed journal, um, devoted an entire page in this journal to review this book. And, and that's highly unusual for a book of this sort, to be reviewed in science in this detail and with this depth. And, and I think it points to the importance of a narrative and stories and convincing people that we can improve the future of the planet. Um, and so the, the closing, I'm going to just read the closing two sentences of this review because I think it captures kind of what's going on here. He goes, I commend Patty for immersing himself into the field of restoration ecology over the eight-year period of writing this book. He makes a convincing case that we have, however hesitantly, begun a journey to restoring the future. So um, let's welcome Patty and an opportunity to see how we can improve this future. Welcome back, Patty. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Am I, am I switched on? Um, Ross, thank you very much for a very generous introduction. I barely recognize myself, but <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Arctic Studies and the Dickey Center and to Osher, who are the co-sponsors, uh, for bringing me back to Dartmouth. It is an enormous pleasure to be here, actually in this hall, where I stood in the spring of 2008 doing a presentation about one of my Basque books. And after that, Ken Yalovitz, who was then the director of the Dickey Center, after a very challenging dinner, 
where I was asked an awful lot more questions than I expected at a casual dinner after a casual, fairly casual reading of a fairly light book. Uh, I was suddenly invited to come back here for a fellowship for three months. So as Ross says, this is definitely Hanover and Dartmouth, uh, one of the homes of this book. It's where I did some of the critical work on it. So that does give me great pleasure to be back here. And um, I want to try and tell you this afternoon about the journey I took in writing this book. Um, ecological restoration, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but there doesn't really seem to be a better phrase. I'm very struck by, as I looked at the field, and I'll tell you in a minute how I discovered the field because it was completely new to me 10 or 11 years ago, but I was very struck by how the field has shifted in a very short period. This is a very young science. It's not a young practice. You could say that ecological restoration has been happening since the first farmer put his or her field out to fallow to re-enrich the soil because they had exhausted it. That's a form of restoration. But as a kind of social and scientific movement, it's only 50 or 60 years old. And as a science, really a hard science, it's only about 20 years old, I would say. But the origins of restoration are American. They're in the American Midwest. And that's one of its strengths, but possibly also one of its weaknesses. It was inspired, the early Midwestern restorationists were inspired, I think, by visions of a pristine past that have been shown to be very flawed. So what I found in my research in the book was that restoration is not really about restoring to some sort of idealized past, but it is about restoring to an imperfect but much better future. Um, and Ross talked about hope and said that there is some optimism in this book, and that is true. I think the message of restoration is a remarkable one for many of us. The, uh, the very idea that you can reverse damage to an ecosystem is, comes as quite a surprise to most people I talk to, even today. However, I don't want to be starry-eyed about it, and I don't want to pretend that it's a silver bullet. So before I talk about the hope and the challenges that hope faces in the specific restoration context, I want to set a broader picture, because I believe that restoration alone will not save our planet. We live in a world where most of us consume too much. Many people don't have enough to eat. It's a very strange world that we have organized. And we are driven, still driven to this day, by the idea that our happiness consists in more material possessions. And if we aspire to having one car or two cars, or if we think our life is not worth living if we don't have a swimming pool, in our backyard, well then, somebody in Rwanda and somebody in Korea and somebody in Ecuador, they're all going to think the same thing. And we're encouraging global society to think the same thing. And I do not believe that our planet's resources can even, could not sustain the level of consumption that American and European society has today if that was spread across the world. We just don't have the resources, and we couldn't restore them fast enough. So there are other challenges facing us. Obviously, climate change, which makes restoration more difficult every day. And when I say climate change, I mean accelerated climate change, accelerated on the best scientific evidence at the moment by human activities. I think that these are huge challenges, and I don't want to minimize them for a moment. And I think that we need to change the way we live if we are going to stand a chance of surviving as a species. And I don't have much guidance as to how we should do that. But this afternoon, I do want to talk about hope, and I want to talk about restoration, but just bearing this rather challenging scenario in mind. Well, restoration, when I went to Iowa City to the International Writing Program on the back of my Basque books, restoration to me was something that you did to a house or to a car or to a painting. I had never heard of ecological restoration. 
And neither had a young English novelist, who you can barely see in this rather bad photograph taken on a wet night. Um, Gregory Normanton was a very bright young novelist, uh, very concerned about the environment. And every morning I used to meet him for a coffee, and it would be, as Ross was saying, more bad news. You know, another, another bit off the Greenland ice sheet, another species gone extinct, more desertification, etc., etc., etc. And I had no answers at all. And then one weekend, we were taken out with your wonderful wildlife writer, uh, natural historian, and novelist, Peter Matheson, on a weekend of prairie restoration. And Gregory and I began to look at each other, and Gregory said, you know, Patty, this, this restoration idea it runs against everything we've been brought up with. Because we had been brought up to believe, and I believe that most people had, that really we have two options in regard to the environment. We can develop, which generally means degrade and destroy much of the biodiversity and ecological functions in the landscape, or we can preserve it. And what does preserve mean? It's actually quite a strange word to use about nature, which is a very dynamic force. Preserve means put up a fence, get rid of the indigenous people, and call it a national park. And that was an American model. It's been an African model. And it's nature without us. Our only place in a national park is as rangers, or as scientists, or as tourists. Human activity doesn't take place in nat national parks. And that's a rather depressing alternative. One restoration in Austra restorationist in Australia, Keith Bradby, described it to me as a form of ecological apartheid. You're either kind of in the human, developed world, or you're in this preserved world. And I think if you think about the word preserve, and as a writer, I think a lot about words, um, preserves in the kitchen, there's something you kind of put in a jar and seal away from everything else. It's, a, it's an odd way to treat nature. And restoration seemed to me to represent, and to Gregory, a different form of engagement. And Gregory's question that night was, what if, what if this is not just some form of Midwestern nostalgia about the prairies they have almost destroyed? What if restoration is a practice in other countries? What would it look like? What would it look like in different ecological contexts and different social and political contexts? And I had one of those terrible moments as a writer where my heart la leapt and sank in the same instant because I suddenly knew that this was the book I desperately wanted to write, but I couldn't write it because it was Gregory's idea. So a couple of weeks later, the idea would not go away. I took Gregory out for a beer, and then another beer, <laughs> then a few more beers, and I finally said to him, Gregory, you know that book about ecological restoration? When are you starting to write it? And Gregory, who is English, upper class, Cambridge, England, educated, looked down his nose at me, and he said, my dear chap, he said, that's nonfiction, as if nonfiction was something slightly soiled. And he said, I don't do nonfiction. <laughs> so I said, well, do you mind if I do? And he said, no, as long as you mention me every time you talk about the book. <laughs> so I'm keeping a promise to Gregory this afternoon. And Ten years later, the idea did become a book, with some difficulty. Back to first principles. What is ecological restoration? Well, experts, both activists and scientists, have been arguing about it since the 1940s. And this is the accepted definition at the moment, that ecological restoration is an intentional activity that initiates or accelerates the recovery of an ecosystem with respect to its health, integrity, and sustainability. Now, there's a lot of problems with this definition, but I think the core of it, the idea that we assist or initiate or accelerate the recovery of a system does kind of get to the core of it, because it tells us two things. One, it's a human engagement with the system, and two, nature is also restoring itself. We are actually accelerating a process uh, that um, we're, we're kind of tending, managing nature, but in a direction, hopefully, that the system 
would have gone in had we not damaged it in the first place. So some examples, reversing damage, as I say, recreating communities of plants and animals that existed on the same site at some point in the past. And immediately you may want to say, yes, but at which point? That's one of the difficult questions about restoration. Restoring ecosystem services, fresh water, fresh air, fertile soil, the kind of services that a wetland provides us. We humans, as our populations have expanded, have built in an awful lot of floodplains and estuaries. And we have put so much asphalt on the ground that the water has nowhere to go but into our basements and maybe onto our first floors. And we wonder why. Well, if you restore wetlands around a city, you can at least to some extent mitigate the impact of flooding by you, you're creating these kind of natural sponges around a city. And I do believe that economic and social arguments for restoration are vital if it is ever to get real traction in our societies. Just to give you one example, the Schulenberg Prairie, some of you may have seen it at Morton Arboretum near Chicago. Very beautiful. Um, still faces a lot of problems. A lot of invasive plants still get in there. Uh, restoration faces huge difficulties always. I spoke at the beginning about the visions that inspired restoration. And one of them is an ecological vision, the idea of the balance of nature. The early restorationists tended to talk about systems as if they simply went through a process of natural succession. So one plant community replaces another till you reach a climax system, for example, the closed canopy oak forest, and then you've got nature in balance forever and ever. Well, in fact, as they were articulating that view of restoration, cutting edge ecologists were saying no. The balance of nature is actually a fallacy. Nature is a very dynamic system. It's always in flux. And a system that appears to be in a steady state climax to us is always moving. What's evolution about? It's always evolving towards something else. So that, that makes restoration a little more complicated. And the other vision is a very European settler vision. It's a vision of paradise without people, which I think is the vision that inspired the great national parks. And it's a vision that the white settler imagines that the native peoples, wherever they go, had very little or no impact on the environment. And therefore, it's kind of, this is the Garden of Eden. This is nature as God intended it to be. And that's what we should preserve. But of course, and we've really learned an awful lot about this, particularly in Amazonia, in the last 20, 30 years. This is nonsense. Peoples all over the world, we're all the same species. And we go out and we change the environment to get what we want out of it. Whatever position you take, this is not an ethical statement. It's just a statement of fact. It's what human beings do, whatever race they belong to, whatever color they are. And the, the view that there was some kind of pristine landscape out there was kind of, it made the target for restoration. I mentioned a moment ago that the big question for restoration is, which point in the past do you restore to? Well, for many of the early restorationists in the Midwest, it seemed to be 1491. It was, metaphorically speaking, obviously, it was whatever the landscape was pre-white settlement. Well, there's no particular reason to go back to that point. You could go back to an earlier point, or you could go to a later point. And in fact, the practice of restoration, the attempt to restore systems itself, was one of the things that showed people that both these visions were flawed, that you're dealing with dynamic systems, and you're also dealing, in almost all cases, with landscapes that have been radically altered by human beings in the past. And if you don't understand that ecological history, and cultural history, and ecological and cultural history in our period are really very closely allied. If you don't understand that relationship between humans and the landscape in the past, you'll have great difficulty restoring it in the present for the future. So I think these are the key questions. What are we restoring to? What role should human beings play in restored ecosystems? <laughs> 
And slightly more frivolously, what should we do when we can't find paradise? Well, I would suggest we should, for a start, restore. Future and past are always in a relationship in restoration. And James Aronson, a very distinguished restoration ecologist from St. Louis, who now lives in France, uh, he borrows a, pro a proverb from Madagascar. And he says, the restorationist is like a chameleon with one eye on the past and one eye on the future. But I would add, acting in the present. So what are we restoring to? Over the next few minutes, I just want to give you a kind of tasting menu of the book, of sites I visited. The book's rather fat, fatter than my publishers intended it to be. So I don't have time this afternoon to explain in any detail what happens at each of these sites. But I hope that my lightning visits to them with you will beg many questions. And hopefully, we'll have time to deal with some of those questions afterwards. The first project I looked at after Prairies was Operation Migration, which you're probably familiar with. If you're not, I suggest you Google it, because it provides many remarkable images of juvenile whooping cranes being taught to migrate by human beings dressed as cranes in these Leonardo da Vinci microlight aircraft. It's a really extraordinary project. And I had the privilege of traveling with them from uh, south through Wisconsin towards Florida, caught up with them again in Tennessee. It was kind of a combination of um, conservation and rock and roll circus, because you've got about 40 people traveling on the road providing the, the logistics for this operation. And of course, it's not ecological restoration, properly speaking. It's species reintroduction. But if you reintroduce a charismatic species like the whooping crane, you do raise questions about restoration, particularly if you're dealing with migration, right along that route. Because there's no point in restoring the species if you don't restore the habitat that will enable it to survive on its own. So you need a necklace of wetlands from Wisconsin to Florida so that when these birds are migrating on their own, they will be able to feed, to roost, to nest. It's a project that, and I can't emphasize this enough, that faces problems and challenges. The main problem it's facing at the moment is that the whooping cranes are not breeding well. They're, they're migrating on their own back and forth now, and they're now taking juveniles. You can introduce juveniles to the adult flock, and you've got them migrating with the adults without the microlites. But they're not uh, breeding as well as they should be. Moving further afield, I went to South Africa to look at a very, very different project, working for water. And this project, I don't think it's as well known as it should be, but it was born in the very dark period when South Africa was in virtual civil war under a state of emergency under the apartheid regime and attempting a transition to democracy. And during this period in the 1980s, a group of botanists became very concerned about native plant biodiversity because South Africa, South Africa was being infested by alien invasive trees, mainly Australian eucalypts and wattles. Now, they realized that a government, uh, certainly the apartheid government, was not going to pay great attention to this. But neither, they feared, would the new majority government coming on the route to power under Nelson Mandela. So they decided they needed an economic argument as well. So they went to hydrologists and they said, isn't it likely that big trees consume much more water than our native shrub vegetation? And the hydrologists said, yes, probably, though they hadn't actually done any replicated experiments to prove it. So they, they go to the cabinet when uh, Mandela is elected in his first term, and they go to the Minister for Water and Forestry Affairs, and they say, we have this plan to clear invasive alien species and to restore water. Enormously important. If you can augment the South African water table at a moment when demand for water is going to soar because the black population is now enfranchised and is demanding the same water rights, quite rightly, as the white population had enjoyed for many years, but is much more numerous, well, then South Africa needs all the water it can get. 
So it seemed like a strong argument, but the minister, Kader Asmal, said, well, two things aren't good enough and need something else. Everything that goes through this cabinet must relieve poverty. So he added the idea of clearing the invasive alien plants through a massive public works program, something like your Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. And so this is a big budget program, many millions of dollars, employs many people, and isn't it wonderful? It's win, win, win. You get more biodiversity back, you get water back, and you restore human communities out of poverty. The difficulty is that if you try and do those three things at the same time, it's likely that you may not do be able to do any of them very well. For example, if you were doing ecological restoration, properly speaking, you'd focus the program where the ecological problem is greatest. But if it's a public works program, every village in the country is going to want a slice of it. So it gets a bit skewed. But that's not a reason for any despondency because it's a very well managed program and they have twice invited outside experts to come in and survey all three aspects of the program and they've published very severe criticisms and they've adapted their management to meet those needs. So I think this is a program with all its problems that offers a model, probably not just in the developing world either, but for combining ecological restoration with economic restoration with social restoration. Another great program with severe problems is the North Branch Restoration Project in Chicago. And this raises a question, I think every project I looked at in the book raises questions about who gives permission for restoration, particularly on public land. In Chicago, a man called Steve Packard was motivated to restore prairie and prairie savanna in the forest preserves inside the city. And this meant burning and herbiciding huge areas of European buckthorn that had invaded the preserves and squeezed out the native species. And for about 15 years, these people did a wonderful job. And if you like prairie savanna, the forest preserves look very good today in many cases. They made, in my view, not in their view, they made one very big mistake they did not seek the permission of the communities in which they were working. They did seek the permission of the city authorities who were delighted to find citizen volunteers coming in and managing the forest preserves much better than they had. But they didn't seek the permission of the people living on the perimeters of the preserves, some of which are quite small. You're talking a hectare, a couple of hectares. And so they were burning in people's backyards. They were herbiciding in people's backyards. And of course, people had lots of questions. They had cultural values. They had grown up beside these preserves full of buckthorn, and some of them liked the buckthorn. Above all, though, I think, they didn't like one group of citizens deciding how their public parks should be managed. There was a huge conflict, uh, many demonstrations of, of this nature, and Chicago politicians, as we know, are not stupid. And they felt that the wind had changed. And they slapped a ban on restoration for up to 10 years on many of these sites. And this is still a very, very bitter controversy in Chicago. And um, I have found it the most painful chapter to write because I have very high regard for the people who did this restoration. I've interviewed them many times. I probably researched this chapter more thoroughly than any other one. Um, but they absolutely hate what I've done because they have, in my view, somebody, a, a great restoration philosopher, Bill Jordan, uh, when I talked to him about my difficulties in writing about this project, he said, well, now you know there's fundamentalism in restoration as well, don't you? And one of the curious things in writing this book, and for me as a non-scientist in engaging with scientists also, has to be to see how the same kind of mechanisms that operate within armed conflict situations in the Basque country or in my native Ireland, where communities demonize each other, that happens in science as well. It's not all about evidence and hypothesis. People are very attached to certain ideas and they will get stuck with them and they may make great advances and then decide this is as far as we go. We have found the truth, 
and you can't go any further. Um, I found this a very enlightening thing as a, as a non-scientist entering the scientific world. I'm going to talk about a couple more projects in a little detail and then just run through the others. But this one I want to talk about in particular because it may have some relevance to New England. This is the Cinque Terre in, uh, in, this, in uh, south of Liguria, south of Genoa. And these lines you're seeing here, rather like a, a cornrow hairstyle, these are dry stone walls. And the people of the Cinque Terre, which is very small, it's 20 kilometers long, it's a very steep slope down straight to the Mediterranean, um, and maybe about 900 meters high. And over a thousand years, and possibly a lot longer, they built up these terraces, and they also created the earth within these terraces. They brought seaweed up from the sea, they brought earth from inland, and they created very fertile soil, and they created a wonderful, very productive Mediterranean agricultural system. But of course, this is backbreaking work. And once jobs became available in factories or in towns, nobody wanted to do this, or very few people wanted to do this. So the terraces get abandoned, and nature comes back in, into this landscape that we have transformed radically. And so you see there, you see these, um, these darker green patches are patches of not invasive aliens. This is native Mediterranean vegetation. So this is spontaneous ecological restoration, just like the New England forest came back after farmers abandoned it. So isn't it a good thing? Well, not in this case, because that vegetation gets into the dry stone walls, and the roots begin to tear the dry stone walls apart. And then while boars come in and tear them apart further, and in an area that was always geologically unstable, you get a very rapid increase in landslides. And you get these scree slopes, which keep moving. So very little vegetation can find a purchase on, it for, on them for very long. So that by a curious paradox, the spontaneous restoration of a natural system results in less biodiversity, not more. There are also arguments that these terraces provide niches for many species that are threatened in, on, the, on this Italian coastline. The native vegetation system isn't threatened. It's very common. So how do you restore this landscape? And the national park that the Cinque Terre has now become argues that it should be restored as a cultural landscape. You restore traditional agriculture in order to maximize the biodiversity. And I think there's a lesson for many countries, many places in that, certainly in my native Ireland, that even restoring where you have agricultural, uh, sorry, industrial agricultural systems, if you just restore even three meters around each wheat field, you may actually create a great deal more biodiversity. But if you actually go back to traditional mowing, even in a few cases, you may provide habitat for birds that are threatened with extinction. So traditional agriculture can be one of the tools of restoration. Now, in the middle, excuse me, in the middle of my research, particularly at a conference in San Jose in 2007, I became aware that climate change was rushing up the agenda of restoration issues. And this is uh, Jasper Ridge, uh, which is an experimental site managed by Stanford University, where small-scale experiments are being done about the possible alternative futures of the San Jose landscape under the influence of climate change. And we talked about this a lot at the conference. And I was particularly struck by a, an American ecologist, Patricia Townsend, working in Costa Rica. She gave a very simple example. She works with cloud forest. But she said, if you take a Costa Rican mountain and you divide it into three zones, C at the bottom, B in the middle, A at the top, she is actually seeing, over a 10-year period, the vegetation from zone C move into zone B, and B move into zone A, and the vegetation of zone A threatened with extinction. So she has to ask herself the question, in this situation, what do I restore? Do I try and keep the sea vegetation in zone C, 
Or do I start restoring it in zone B? Do I try and anticipate climate change? And some very strange arguments have come out of this debate with some restoration ecologists saying that we are now seeing the massive emergence of novel ecosystems which cannot be restored, that have crossed an ecological threshold. In a word, it's a complex argument, but I think they're wrong. And I think they're wrong because of a project that many of them have worked on. This is, I think, one of the most remarkable examples of carefully managed restoration in the world. And this is restoration from an ecosystem that has been much more radically altered than climate change is likely to do for the foreseeable future. This is the Jarrah eucalyptus forest near Perth in southwestern Australia. And Alcoa mined this forest for bauxite, for aluminum. And so they knocked down the forest, they removed the topsoil, and then they removed four meters depth of overburden to get the bauxite out. And when you go into those red dirt pits, all you see is red dirt with very, very little biodiversity left in it. Because obviously, most of the microfauna and microflora that are the basis of any ecosystem in the topsoil are gone. And um, that far down, there really is very little life left. And yet, 20 years later, that's the same forest. Now, I imagine some of you are saying, well, that's just the usual corporate greenwashing. They've just done what mining companies do all over the world. They plant a lot of green trees and tell us that they've rehabilitated the site. Well, that's indeed what Alcoa used to do here and what they still do, as far as I know, on many sites around the world. But on this particular site, they have actually employed scientists to do a really detailed inventory of all of the biodiversity of the forest. And these are very, very biodiverse forest. May look monocultural here, but it's really diverse. And within 20 years, they are getting back 98% of the species. Not the species abundance. That hasn't happened yet. It may never happen. But they are getting 98% of the species back. And the 2% that's missing is largely because of the absence of dead wood, because you don't get much dead wood after 20 years. And many species depend on dead wood for food, for nesting, whatever. Obviously, there are questions about this restoration. It's all four meters lower than it was. So its relationship to the water table is going to be different. But it does seem to me an example of where, and I think this is really the critical point, if we invest in restoration, there is no ecological threshold to what we can do. And the science is getting better and better and better. There is an economic threshold. What is society prepared to pay for restoration? What is a corporation prepared to pay for restoration? Now, we pay billions and billions and billions, or we invest billions and billions and billions in built infrastructure every year across the planet. Surely we need to think about investing in the infrastructure that supports our infrastructure. The economy is a subset of the environment and not the other way around. And if we neglect to invest in the environment seriously, not as a kind of afterthought, not as an added on bonus, but as the source of our very life, I think we're making a terrible mistake. How much does this cost Alcoa? It costs them less than 1% of their profits from this site alone. Not 1% of their turnover, 1% of their profits. It's a very small tax. So I think that the, the threshold we should be most concerned about at the moment is not the ecological one, but the, uh, but the economic one. Getting societies to understand that we must pay for restoration. Very briefly, a couple of other sites. The extraordinary restoration of dry tropical forest on a very large scale in the Guanacaste conservation region in Costa Rica, which Dan Jansen and Winnie Halwax have been leading players. Many, many things one could say about this, but I just want to emphasize one point alone, 
which is the idea of bioliteracy, that if you want society's permission to invest in restoration, you have got to provide an education system that teaches people about the environment in which they live. And this little girl, Maria, told me a story about how she had gone home to her father and said she was learning from her teacher, who came from the National Park, about the fish in their mangrove system. And her father exploded and said, your teacher is an evil woman. She is practically a witch because she is trying to stop us fishing. And Maria said, no, no, you don't understand. She's not trying to stop us fishing. She's trying to stop us fishing in the mangroves themselves because that's where the mother fishes live. And if we don't let the mother fishes look after their children, there will be no fish for my generation. And her father changed his mind. And I happened to encounter a very similar story in Ireland about the restoration of a particular landscape and a particular raptor where people who were very opposed to the system, when their children began to come home, enthused with new arguments about it, changed their minds. So I think working through education is critical. This is a very complicated story. I talked to some students about it earlier, and it, I think, illustrates the terrible decisions that we sometimes have to take because of how far we have damaged ecosystems. New Zealand had no mammals, but it had three bats, but it had no mammals when the first human settlers, the Maoris, arrived only seven or eight centuries ago. And the Maoris brought rats and pigs. And then, a few centuries later, white settlers arrive, and they bring a whole suite of mammal predators, from mice to deer, including domestic dogs and cats. And by the 1960s, because native plants, native insects, native birds, native reptiles, had little or no defenses against these alien mammals, New Zealand became the extinction capital of the world. And New Zealand society, remarkably for a society with strong Anglo-Saxon roots, decided that they were going to have to take very, very radical action. And you're basically looking in New Zealand in conservation areas at a mammal extermination program. And that includes domestic dogs and cats. And most New Zealanders accept this. It reminded me of Aldo Leopold's saying that the price of an ecological consciousness is to know that you live in a world of wounds. And I think that the situation in New Zealand was so grave in the 1960s that most people there recognized they could see the wounds. And they said, we have to heal them. And the surgery is very radical. This is a a possum, a cute furry animal, before it begins to decompose. And that is in a national park, and it's a common sight in New Zealand national parks, a trapped possum. And whereas you or I might feel a little shocked at this or uneasy, your average New Zealander will say, thank God, another possum gone. Now our plants, now our birds stand a better chance. Traditional ecological knowledge is something I was a little skeptical about. Um, I, I do think that, whereas I say it's very important to understand the ecological history of landscapes before white settlers colonized them, I don't necessarily believe in the kind of touch the earth myth that indigenous peoples always managed landscapes in some way better than we did. But skeptical as I was, I was very happy to find an extraordinary example of, to me, true traditional ecological knowledge in the Mayan rainforest, in the Lacandon jungle in Chiapas near the Mexican border with Guatemala. The man on the left is a Lacandon Maya, one of only about 800 still left living in the jungle. The man on the right is an ecologist. And the Lacandon Maya have a way of farming within the rainforest. They slash and burn. They destroy a bit of the environment in order to farm. But they do it in small patches, maybe a hectare, maybe two hectares. And they have, in the first phase, a very, very productive milpa, so-called cornfield, but actually with 50 or 60 productive species growing in it. Once they realize the earth is becoming tired, they begin introducing some of the rainforest species. And some of them, maybe they can harvest nuts from them, or maybe they attract mammals so they can hunt there. <coughs> 
and so on through five different stages of following, meticulously planned. And in the fifth stage, this is over a period longer than a single human lifetime. It's done over a hundred year period. By the fifth phase, they have virtually restored the rainforest plant community. And this is knowledge that scientists, like the ecologist here, simply didn't have. He didn't even know the names of some of the species they were using. They had no scientific names. He certainly didn't know the sequence in which they were planted. And he is now acting as a kind of ambassador for this kind of rainforest management to neighboring Mayan peoples who have lost this knowledge and, encouraged by the Mexican government, got into cattle farming, knocked down their forests and got into cattle pasture, and then found that their land could not support grass or cattle. Couldn't support the kind of grass that cattle need to live. And so they want to restore their rainforest, and this man is taking that technology out to them. And I think this is a remarkable example of a people who did learn to live sustainably, and perhaps it is a kind of iconic lesson for us. Finally, in my native Ireland, this is what happens to a peat bog when you mine it for fuel. It looks like you could never restore it. But there's a semi-restored peat bog. Again, I don't want to be starry-eyed. This is, there are problems here. You can see a conifer plantation nearby, alien conifers marching into the restored bog. But still, you've not only got the plant communities back here that were characteristic of bog, you've also got the processes. You've got the ecological processes that produce peach. And I found that a remarkably inspiring project. It only works for blanket bog. If you know Ireland, we also have raised bog. Doesn't work for raised bog. Raised bog, the hydrology is very complex. And once you damage it beyond a certain point, you may be able to restore a wetland there, but it won't be a raised bog. Finally, a summary of the benefits of restoration. And I think one of the great benefits is a new relationship with nature, a relationship of engagement where we don't have to be the bad guys on the planet. And we don't have to live in this dualistic world of us in the developed world and nature in the preserved world. I think another important point about restoration is that it is a great learning tool for ecologists. Every mechanic knows that the only way you really understand how a car works is to take it apart and put it together again. Very crudely, something similar is true of ecosystems. And unfortunately, we've taken so many ecosystems apart that there are lots of opportunities to try and learn how to put them together again. And obviously, the recovery of nature, native biodiversity is important for many reasons, and I would argue ethically also for its own sake. But in order to get the kind of investment I'm talking about, I think you have to also show people that restoration of ecosystems is restoration of the natural capital and ecosystem goods and services on which all our societies depend. So if you restore a wetland, you get multiple benefits. You get fish stocks for the few food industry, so you get a resource. But you also get waste filtration. You get, as I mentioned earlier, flood control. You get recreational uses. You get spiritual uplift. You get habitat for biodiversity, and many more things. Same thing with a forest. If you look at a forest and you just see it as timber, you're missing a huge part of the picture because you're looking at carbon sequestration, you're looking at water retention, you're looking at pollinators, benefits for pollinators, all sorts of things that our society and our agriculture needs. So I think we have to have this very broad vision of restoration. It's not paradise but I think it is a much better future. I think what encapsulates the idea of restoration for me is this quotation from E.O. Wilson. Let us go beyond mere salvage to begin the restoration of natural environments. There can be no purpose more inspiriting than to begin the age of restoration, reweaving the wondrous diversity of life that still surrounds us. And just a couple of images, E.O. Wilson at Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, which is a remarkable project. 
the canopy of the New Zealand rainforest, now again full of native birds that were threatened with extinction. And back to my native Ireland, great Irish ecologist Catherine Farrell uh, working on the restoration of a peat bog. I'd welcome questions, welcome challenges, arguments. Thank you very much indeed. Population, population growth, is there a conflict with this? Yes, um, bluntly yes, and population is the big issue that we seem to have forgotten about. Um, I think the, what is it, we've gone from, what is it we've gone from, 3 billion to 7 billion uh, since the 1960s, and we're probably going to reach 9 million in 50 years time. Clearly, the pressure that that is putting on the resources of the planet at the most basic level is enormous. And in terms of space, it's enormous. But I do think it's important to focus also on the model of the types of society we have and what we aspire to. Because you could easily see that a very large population could be sustained if people can accept that they don't need all the things we think we need. So there's a double problem there, and they're, they're very, very serious problems. Um, I'm, I'm kind of puzzled as to why we have not focused more on population. I think it's become all sorts of issues about birth control and the way in which birth control was sometimes attempted to be imposed on societies, problems with the Chinese one-child model, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is something we have to think about again, and I think you're, you're absolutely right to raise it. Yes, Pat? Start with the Betsy? So I'm interested in your Alcoa um, forest regeneration. And you were mentioning 1% of their profits is what it took. Because that's a larger scale, really kind of a radical um, restoration. Is a lot of that, you, they start with seeds and seedlings, and then a lot more is natural regeneration, which obviously keeps the cost down? The key to what, yes, there is a lot of natural regeneration. Um, it's, it's, it, it, but the key is what they do with the topsoil. They bring it back. Yeah, well, what they do is, uh, it's almost a bit like the Lacandone Mayan farmers. They're, they're mining uh, in small sections. And as soon as they knock down the forest in one section, they take the topsoil from there and put it onto a section that they have ready for restoration, where they have mined already. And they do this within five to seven days. And that's vital, because what that does is it preserves most of the microbial life in the topsoil. And that is the trigger for the natural regeneration. But they also do a lot of planting. And one of the things they found was that certain groups of plants are pretty recalcitrant to regenerating naturally in this new environment at first. So they built a laboratory and they generate sedges on tissue. And the cost of each sedge plant, not each sedge species, but each plant, is about eight Australian dollars. I think about $2.50 in American. So that is one of the things that makes the project expensive, as well as the fact that they're, they're doing it at all. They're, they're, they do a lot of interesting things. I mean, I, I mentioned that there is clearly an issue for the future in that we've lost four meters here, and it's going to be, that's gonna have some effect but what they do try and do is they try, they, you know, they, 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 they obviously measure the topography before they cut away the four meters, and then they try and reproduce that micro topography when they're, before they put down new overburden and the new topsoil. It's a very, very detailed project. For anyone who's interested in it, the journal Restoration Ecology in 2009 produced a special supplement of I think about 14 or 15 articles uh, from all sorts of different specialities on how this restoration is done. And I think it, I think it really is uh, exemplary. I, many people I talk to in the field who are very experienced describe it as, as the best single restoration in the world. And I think per, perhaps particularly because it's starting from such an absolutely destroyed base, but then getting back, at least initially, such a very good result. Clearly, we need to be very careful here. 
We don't want restoration to become the permission for every corporation to destroy even more than they're destroying in search of resources at the moment. That's always a balance. But since they're going to mine there anyway, and they've already had the license, it's much better that they're restoring than not restoring, I think. Huh? So, in the process of this odyssey, in becoming tuned into this positive view, did you run across or in any way engage with uh, the landscape urbanism movement, the movement among architects and landscape architects, to redefine the paradigm of inevitable human growth? No, Are you familiar not with that term? No. Um, it's, I hate to call it a, a, a rage, but it is a rage. Uh, it's a, an alternative to um, the nostalgia of uh, the, the um, urban, uh, I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank on what the, the uh, seaside and the, the, the cutesy little fishing villages and walkable community stuff, which fits into a, a nice quaint uh, vision of architectural future. And it's basically saying that it, it, what, the way we build on the landscape rather than within the landscape needs to be radically changed, much in the line of uh, the deep change you're talking about. And the brand of landscape urbanism, uh, it's being contested as to who's going to mature that in terms of study, whether it's going to be landscape architects or architects. But it is a, 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 an area of academic growth. And there's some communities, actually some cities in China that are being built with basically folding human development under or within the overburden, as you call it, the, the landscape. Really? And some of it is... That's something. completely new to me. Excuse me? That's completely new to me. Thank okay, you. I'll, I'll send you an email or something. On it. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm always interested in motivation behind uh, these uh, ennobling stories or uh, stimulating stories. What made Alcoa do this? Did they do it out of the goodness of their hearts, or was this, you, at one point, you used the term tax. Uh, is, this, was a gov is this a government mandate that made them do Well, that? they're way ahead of the curve in terms of the requirements. They're, they have set themselves requirements that are far ahead of the requirements set by government at the moment. There is an element, I think, of future proofing about it. This is a very, very valuable bauxite mine. And there is, there, they reckon at the current rates of extraction, they could be mining for, I think, about another 40 years. So they were very keen to, to protect themselves against changes in people's thinking and therefore it changes in the requirements. But I, I don't want to rule human goodness out of the court altogether. I think that there was a chief executive in that particular case on that particular project who was a bit of a visionary and he saw an opportunity to do something very, very different. There were other things, there were other factors, there were a lot of social pressures including from within the company itself in that area because this Jarrah forest, first of all, it sits right in the Perth watershed. And everyone knew that if you, if you left a landscape, certainly if you left a landscape without any rehabilitation on it, you were going to be talking about massive erosion, damage to water supply, et cetera, et cetera. There was also a strong recreational argument, apparently, that you know, many of the miners and many of the mining executives actually love this forest. And they did not want to destroy it wholesale. And when they saw that they also had, there is a group of restoration ecologists based in Perth uh, who are very, very skilled. And they kind of put, they said, well, maybe. And they saw what some of the things they were doing, including right in the center of Perth itself, some really remarkable restoration projects. And I think they saw an opportunity. And of course, they get lots of awards. They've got awards from the United Nations. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen them questioned very, um, very effectively, some of their executives uh, at a conference in Perth, and they will admit that they're not doing anything remotely like this at a lot of other sites, and particularly in their African sites. Uh, and, and, and I found it quite, quite offensive that one of the executives said, well, this is because we have to operate with corrupt governments who have no environmental concerns, as if they couldn't help in setting the conditions for their sites elsewhere. Um, Somebody, if you'll excuse my language, but I'm quoting directly from Richard Hobbs, he said that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Alcoa in most places behave like any other corporate bastard, but here they do a really good job. 
So it's, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of motivations. The reason I was asking is that I attended another conference. Uh, this was at Tux. It's always interesting. This is, so you get the business blend. And there was a, pre a presentation by, I can't remember his first name. His last name is Winston. And he's become kind of the star of sustainability preached to big business. So he's an MBA type. Uh, and he wrote a book called Green to Gold. Uh, or, yeah, Green to Gold, in which he's, he makes the point that the sustainability is kind of critical to business. So it's not just sort of a sidelight. Uh, if your corporate headquarters is in New York City, you, you can't be happy if it's under five feet of water. Uh, and it's starting to catch, and he's starting to get CEOs that are preaching from the top. You know, sustainability is one of our goals, is our business model. Without it, you know, we end up losing. Uh, so I'm just wondering if that was it's a, at the Alcoa level or whether it was just sort of local regional politics. It's a, it's a critical area and it's one that has to be looked at with great care and attention because clearly uh, it's in the, you know, and I, I, I think we, we're all aware of the, the number of products in our supermarkets that are now prefaced with the word eco or claim to be sustainably produced. We need to examine these things very carefully. But I think over and beyond that, you are touching on an important point. Corporations at the moment in the society we live in globally are masters of the universe, whether we like that or not. Personally, I don't like it at all, but that is the reality. And I do think that some corporations, they want to survive and they do realize, they, they realize at the top, they realize the extent of the environmental crisis we are facing much more than the general society in which they are living, and I think they are beginning to take measures, some of them. Some of them are obviously moving in the opposite direction. And I don't know how you square eternal growth and internal increasing consumption with sustainability. Well, his argument is that you make money. I mean, it was green to gold. Yeah, yeah. And he could show how you, you make money you, by you, doing these projects. You can do it in some cases, but I don't know if it you can work across Let's that. put it that way. You say is that. Uh, Pat, this may be off topic, but talking about green to gold, I wonder if you uh, encountered GMOs or other modification of uh, plants when you were looking at this <coughs> issue and what your opinion might be of that issue. Not at all. Um, I simply, you know, as I say, the book already got quite fat. Uh, there was, I, I, for example, I leave marine restoration out altogether. There are a lot of topics I don't touch. Uh, GMOs. Uh, I'm a little bit puzzled about the automatic, it seems to me, knee-jerk reaction against GMOs within the environmental movement. You know, if you, if you, um, our, our um, EPA, our Ecological Protection Agency, is experimenting with, to a degree, with genetically modified potatoes at the moment. And I don't see how, if you believe in science, you can actually say they shouldn't be carrying out those experiments. I worry about a kind of fundamentalism there. It also seems to me that we've been one way or another genetically modifying plants for a very long time. Um, but I think we need to be very careful about GMOs for all the reasons that we know about. But we've got to distinguish, it seems to me, a whole range of arguments. I don't enter into these arguments in the book. But we need to distinguish between Monsanto's original strategy, which was you know, the, the killer gene that kind of strategy, which to me was clearly absolutely reprehensible to the idea that we might be able to modify some plants in order to make them more productive without disastrous secondary side effects. Uh, I actually was thinking about if the GMO movement goes forward, uh, would it really negate this um, Mayan example? Would it, because you're requiring people in, let's call it the, the developing world, or whatever you want to call it, to have foreign uh, exchange <coughs> so that they could obtain these products. Uh, if that occurs, um, you negate this Mayan example. You won't have that operating. Yeah, that it could become a problem. But to be honest, it's not something I've looked at in any depth. You talked about how it's in, like, as the populations are going to start growing, but also between developing countries, how important it is that we foster, we stop the consumer culture from developed countries from the U.S. to spread globally, but how economic incentive is going to be a huge factor in whether or not ecological restoration takes off the ground. But how is that going to work with countries that are developing and don't have 
to say effective economic power and incentives? I think with I think with great difficulty, and I'm not saying that. I, you know, certainly the developed world cannot preach to the developing world. Um, the, the, the first system that has got to change, I think, has got to be our one. But I'm saying that if people cannot see economic benefits and only see economic, economic neg negatives from the conservation of biodiversity and from restoration, well, most people are going to resist it and it's not going to happen. But it's a very delicate balance, very delicate balance. I'm, I'm going to need to, to cut off here. Patty uh, has dinner with a group of students in a few minutes. And I also want to leave enough time for you to find them at the table out front if you want to dive into the book and some details. The other amazing part of the book is actually his description and conversations with the people behind all this. So that's the, the essential part of the story is that this is a human endeavor, and, and we, can, we can learn from the individuals that, that are involved in the book. So Patty, thank you very much. And, uh,